So, we've all been looking through Daniel these last few weeks. Today is, as the video showed, the writing on the wall passage. So, we, like I said, we've been looking at Daniel for the last four weeks. We've gone through the history. And what I'm going to try and do today, because it's quite a long passage, and I will be referring back to it. In your Bibles, 890 is the page that Daniel 5 is on. So, please just grab a hold of that, because you'll, I will be referring back to it. So, Nebuchadnezzar's died. It's 23 years after he's died, actually, to be precise. And now we've got this new king, King Belshazzar. In some ways, Trevor and I were discussing before the start of the service, he's actually not the real king. He's almost like a deputy king, like a co-regent. His dad is the real king, and he's called Nabon Nabonymous, it says in chapter 5. He's the real king, but he's kind of, he's the, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, this Nabominus, who doesn't really want to be king. So what he's done, he said to his son, Belshazzar, you can be king. I don't really want to be king. You be king. And so Belshazzar is the king of Babylon, the city of Babylon. But, and he's kind of got authority over the region, but his dad is the real king. Many of you know, or you may not know, that actually when I was at university, I was a historian. I studied history, various time periods in history. I know there's other people who love history and love reading books on it. All you have to do is ask my wife how many history books I've got on Hitler and Stalin and other people around that sort of period of the World War II uh, that I was really interested in. I'm just going to tell a quick story. So, in the months leading up to the Allied invasion of Normandy in World War II, historians tell us that the Allies had launched a successful deception campaign against Germany. Among other measures, the Allies had placed inflatable dummy tanks around the south coast of England and employed double agents to report back to the German hierarchy, all to convince Hitler that the impending invasion of Western Europe was to happen in the French city of Calais rather than where it actually did happen, which was on the Normandy beaches. So despite that, everyone knew that the Allies were going to invade at some point and, and make a push into Western Europe. Hitler was convinced at that point his defences that he'd constructed all along that bit of France were solid enough. He didn't really need to worry about any sort of invasion. So what's the day of D-Day, anyone know? June the 6th, I heard it muttered there somewhere. June the 6th, 1944, is a famous date in our history. All of these factors came to a head. The Allies invaded Western Europe in Normandy, and these reports of this invasion began to flood in to the German HQs. And the response to a number of reasons was lacking from the Germans. For one thing, the necessary reinforcements weren't able to get to where they needed to because they were all stuck up at Calais, and the only person who could authorise their movement was Hitler himself. Hitler, uh, on that morning, was asleep. And actually, the historians tell us that no one dared wake him. They were all a bit scared of him, so they didn't dare wake him. But then when he woke up, he wasn't actually that bothered that they'd invaded. He kind of knew it was coming and thought, well, today's the day, so you know what, we'll, we'll take them on head, head on. What I would say, the truth is that that D-Day was the decisive day in World War II that I would say brought the end of that war. As we look in this Daniel 5, so refer to your Bibles, and like I said, I'll be ru running through bits of it, we read a story of another ruler, King Belshazzar, who is the son, like I said, of this Nabominus. He was not alarmed when he should have been. Trevor and I were discussing before the service, what's happened is armies have encircled Babylon, the city. What's Belshazzar doing? What does it say in the, the book? What does it show in the video? What's he doing? He's having a party. Having a few drinks with friends. Actually, not just a few drinks, a lot of drinks. There was a thousand people invited to this party. He wasn't bothered. Why did he have this cockiness, you may ask, of why he was so secure in his city? And I think it comes to the fact that when I was researching this, Babylon itself as a city was huge. Historians reckon that it was about 10 square miles in size. Now, I don't know how big that is, but I know it's eight miles from here to Manchester, so it's eight miles that way, and it's the same distance that way. That's the size of Babylon. That's how big the city itself was. Another thing that's quite impressive is the walls, at some point, and this is all backed, backed up with historical analysis, were 300 foot high, pretty high, 
and eight feet deep as well. Pretty big wall. So actually, it's an impenetrable city. And it also had food stores that could last 20 years. That's how most battles used to end in, in those periods. They just starve the city out, they'd encircle it and starve it out. Belshazzar, cocky, not bothered. And he thinks, you know what, they've got all these armies around the, the city, I'm not that bothered. So, as the narrative unfolds, and again, please, just, just keep glancing at Daniel, those first few chapters, and it'll come clear what I'm talking about. He should have took this a bit more seriously. What he should have done, Belshazzar, is ended the party. And as we see towards the end of the part, uh, this chapter, this is not only the last night of Belshazzar, it's also, as Trevor said, the last day of the Babylonian Empire. So we'll see in a moment that Belshazzar also should have known about the responsibilities that he had before the Lord. He should have known how a king should be conducting himself. Like Trevor said, Daniel's 80. Belshazzar has grown up under his father, under his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And he's seen that idolatry and pride would eventually see big consequences from God. So as we work through this text, I'm going to break it down into a classic, classic Anglican three-point sermon. First point, relying on God's patience. Second point, ignoring God's truth. And third point, knowing that God is sovereign in salvation. So let's look at the first point. Relying on God's patience. So as we've already seen in this chapter, in the, look at the opening chapters of that verse. Everything that has transpired that we have surveyed during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember back a couple of weeks in, cha in chapter 1. I think, Trevor, you did the sermon on that, on chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, and we were looking at his first year of reign. He was the king of Babylon at the time, and he just ascended to the throne. And when he, when he did, he took the best and the brightest out of Judah and took them as prisoners into captivity and labour in his kingdom. So as we move now in the book through chapters 2, 3 and 4, which I think Seb spoke on and someone else spoke on, I can't remember who, doesn't really matter, we propelled further and deeper into Nebuchadnezzar's reign. We slowly see it unfold and how an ungodly king who's gri gripped by idolatry He's obsessed with visions about himself, about his own grandeur. He continually fails to see where the Lord is in all of that. But eventually he's brought to humility in chapter 4. After which it seems he's got it. He's got what the Lord wants him to get. So Nebuchadnezzar's reign covered about 40 years. And though we don't know where many of those events in the various chapters are in that sort of timeline... One thing that's clear is that when we look at Nebuchadnezzar's story through our own theological spectacles, that the Lord was exceedingly patient with Nebuchadnezzar. Very patient, in fact. Throughout all the years and the pride and the hardness of heart and the idolatry and all that other good stuff we saw in those verses, Daniel 1 through 4, the Lord was so patient with Nebuchadnezzar and he didn't deal with him with the judgment which his sins merited. So far, we've seen in Daniel uh, God's abundant patience, like I said, which has been unfolded. But there, look to chapter 5. Now look where you are in the Bibles. Three kings have come and gone since Nebuchadnezzar's died. 23 years, three kings come and gone. Now we've got Belshazzar. So the kingdom is far from that powerhouse that it was under Nebuchadnezzar's reign. If Belshazzar is any indication of the spiritual environment in the kingdom... I think that's probably given us a hint of why things haven't gone so well since Nebuchadnezzar. So, look with me at verse 1. We learn in the opening line that King Belshazzar was a, made a great feast. I, you know, it sounds nice, that. I wouldn't mind a bit of that. Uh, that may sound in itself a bit innocuous, but let's look at it a bit more. You see back in chapter 3 where it opened, we heard a similar phrase said that Nebuchadnezzar made something. What did he make? He made a colossal image of gold that towered above the city. It was an idolatry. It was blatant idolatry. It was his symbol of power. It was something to marvel at, something to behold. Yet when we see Belshazzar in chapter 5, he's doing something similar. He's not building an idol, but he's making a massive feast to show how powerful and important a person he is. Has one theologian put it, Ian Dugwood, 
He said, while Nebuchadnezzar demonstrated through his life great military success, he destroyed cities, he, you know, he erected statues and idols, he was actually, and I, I didn't know this until I started looking at it, I probably should have done, but he constructed one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and all King Belshazzar was able to do was to arrange a booze-filled party. You see, the kingdom of Babylon has fallen from the once great heights it occupied to this current, it's a bit weak, isn't it? It's a bit not great. And is that just not an illustration of the sinful spiritual state that the city and the people have got to? Belshazzar, we learn, has arranged this drinking party with his nobility. I think a thousand people, it says in the chapter. And then once he's had too much to drink, he makes the demand that just show how desensitized he'd become to it all. What does he do? I think that's in verse 2 and 3. He looks and he says, go and get the cups, go and get the, the goblets, go and get the... That had, that had come from the temple about 70 years earlier, the vessels of gold and of silver that had been taken. What he does, he says, do you know what? Can't get much worse. Go and get them cups out of that cupboard. We'll have a, we'll have a drink out of them. These are sacred, these are sacred cups, these. So what that makes it even worse is that, like I said earlier, that Belshazzar, he's grown up with Daniel. He's seen all this happen in the temple. He's seen Nebuchadnezzar. He's seen all that stuff that's happened. And Stuart Oylot, in this book that Trevor lent me, you're very good, Trevor. He always has a book for a sermon. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. It was really helpful, actually. It's a great book if you want to read a bit more on Daniel. He explains a bit more about this. So what this means, he, Belshazzar, had lived as a boy and a youth through the events of the first four chapters of Daniel. So when Nebuchadnezzar discovered four young men who were exceptional and worshippers of Jehovah's, Belshazzar had witnessed it. He would have heard Daniel giving interpretation of his grandfather's dreams. He would have joined in the wonderment of seeing the men in the furnace. And he would have seen Nebuchadnezzar's personal faith. Belshazzar had grown up alongside Daniel and seen the wonders and faith displayed. Why had he not grasped it himself, then, you might ask? In one sense, Belshazzar's actions in Daniel 5 are illustrations of an unrestrained pride at work. He knew of God's patience, thank you, with his grandfather, and he should have learned so much from that, but he doesn't. Paul, first one, which everyone's reading it. So this is Daniel 5, 5 to 7. At this point in the narrative, we don't know quite what the context of what's been written on the wall, but how freaky would that be just to see some fingers writing a message on the wall? You can see that Belshazzar is absolutely terrified by it. His complexion changed, and the phrase that we read, his, his limbs gave way. Show how scared he was. He immediately summons the best and the brightest with the promise of a great reward. Whoever can solve this riddle for him as soon as possible. Belshazzar might not know what exactly this message from God is, but he knows it's important. And his response suggests that he knows this is probably not a good thing for him. We know as we read on that because he has presumed upon the patience of God that we've seen in Daniel 1 to 4, he's worried now. Theologically, the consequences that Belshazzar is about to reap are an outward being of what Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans 2, 4 to 5. So Belshazzar knew more than Nebuchadnezzar knew. At this point, he knows more than Nebuchadnezzar do. He'd seen the incredible story of God's patience with his grandfather, and that should have led him to repentance. But he doesn't. He don't get it. Why doesn't he get it? Bef you know, before we get to that God's patience, th the reason might be that he presumes upon his patience. He might be that he thinks, well, my grandfather had all this patience bestowed upon him. Maybe I'll get it as well. But they don't. We'll come to back, back to that point in a minute. So the second point I mentioned was suppressing God's truth. But this is the crux of the story. So 
So, in order to prepare the way for Daniel and to offer some temporary relief into this situation, the Queen, who commentators point out is probably like the Queen Mother, or maybe Nebuchadnezzar's wife, maybe, they're not sure, she enters the scene and informs Belshazzar that there's this man in the kingdom who can make sense of the riddles that have been written on the wall. She talks about Daniel and how Daniel aided Nebuchadnezzar in his day and how Daniel was able to offer uh, an interpretation of his dreams. So when Daniel comes before Belshazzar, if you look again in verse 13, the king begins to undress him. Commentators note for a number of reasons that Belshazzar probably wasn't unaware of Daniel's existence. Like I said, he's grown up with Daniel. For one, the description provides in verse 13 through 16 goes slightly beyond the queen's description. There's even more a subtle slight to address to Daniel when he reminds him of, that he is one of the exiles of Judah. Belshazzar knows that Daniel's been there all along, but why is he not called upon him? Why has he gone out and said, bring all the brightest and the, the astrologers? And now we turn to, I'm just going to read again, uh, sorry, Daniel 5, 22. Blimey, that's quite a, he's done quite well there, hasn't he? Daniel, he's gone in front of the king and he's basically said, you've done, you know what you've done is not right. You know what you've done is against what the God, wants you, God wants you to do. You're praising idols. You're praising these cups of silver, gold and bronze, wood, iron and stone. But what we learn from Belshazzar is an example of what the Apostle Paul spoke about and warned about in Romans 1, 18 to 23. So what makes it worse here is that Belshazzar knew. He knew all that. And he all certainly knew of Daniel and who Daniel was. He knew what his grandfather had been through. And he should have known that the Most High rules over everything. Yet, with all this revelation at his disposal, he exchanges the glory of the immortal God for idols of silver, bronze, wood, stone, iron. Belshazzar's sin here wasn't rooted in ignorance. According to Paul, no sin is rooted in ignorance of God. It's rooted in knowledge. We see that, the, that unfold in the final part of our passage. So God is sovereign in salvation. If you can read Paul 5.24 to 31, I think that's the end of the passage. It just ties it all together quite nicely. Now we have the verdict pronounced in Daniel's speech thus there. He's been acting as a sort of attorney of sorts, really. And this is how Israel's prophets function sometimes as a mouthpiece of God. It brings those words, mene, mene, tekel and parsons. That's the verdict. It's like being in a courtroom. That's the verdict. These words are Aramaic root words. They're not Hebrew words like most of the Old Testament is in. And on the surface of it, and you saw it in the video, these words could be referred to weights. They're almost like, I was going to start thinking of the weights, like kilograms, grams, smaller than grams. I can't think of on my feet that well. It's basically weights in the descending order. The many, many Tekel and Parsons are going down. But with some minor adjustments, and again, I'm not going to take this as my own, but I've read this somewhere, but these words can be turned into verbs. And it's almost like it's saying, this is the end of the kingdom. This is where it's going down. And that's what Daniel explains and his interpretation. It charts that there's a descending fashion of the Babylonian kingdom. Your days are numbered. You've been weighted in the balance and your kingdom is going. In many respects, Belshazzar has been uh, revealed through this verdict to just be like that rich fool that Luke describes in Luke 12, I think it is, who after building up his own kingdom, settles down and says, I've got what I need, I've got ample goods, I'll be eat, drink and be merry. Belshazzar's doing exactly the same there. He's drinking and convincing himself that those enemies that have gone round the city, they're not going to be able to get in. So, if Daniel spoke, apparently, Belshazzar, and read it in the text, got nothing to say. It's not like he sort of goes, what can I do to make it better? He gives Daniel the purple robe and says, you're now like the third highest person in the kingdom. But really, I think he's basically agreed that something bad's going to happen. He waits to die. He's waiting to die. If you look at your Bibles again, right at the end, it kind of just almost goes and lies down and thinks, well... That's the end of that. And we learn, as Trevor said, that very night, King Belshazzar was killed. 
And ancient history tells us that very night also that the, the invading armies marched into Babylon without a fight. It wasn't entirely bloodless because one of the Persian generals obviously killed uh, Belshazzar. So in the space of just one chapter, in the space of Daniel 5, we've got this story about Belshazzar, about one Babylonian king and how his life goes from here to here. Daniel 1 to 4, like Trevor says, we saw 40 years of Nebuchadnezzar's life, various points in his life, various things that happened. Yeah? But this is one chapter. And then next week, I think you're preaching again, Trevor, Darius the Mede, that's the next king, and a bit about that, and about in chapter 6, and what happens there. I won't spoil the, uh, the thunder, but one of the best, uh, best chapters in Daniel. So, now the story's finished. You're all sat there and thinking, that's a lovely story, Jamie, but so what? So what? Well, how does it, it, great. Does, how does it impact me today? Let's look at a couple of things, a couple of applications, maybe, that we can maybe take away. The first thing is around the fact that somehow and somewhere probably rooted in our soul, this story satisfies our sense of justice insofar as that the Babylonian Empire, if you know anything about history, not very nice people. That whole Nebuchadnezzar reign, he goes and does some pretty horrific things. The Babylonians, have, you know, they've been found in the balance and as, as, uh, as Daniel said, they've been found waiting. Yet... As heinous as those sins were, Nebuchadnezzar was forgiven, wasn't he? As we see in chapter 1 to 4. Second point is the Lord is sovereign over salvation. What do I mean by that? It's, it's strange, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar has been found to be a pretty horrific person, but what does, the God, what does God do to him? He saves him. 40 years. You would think that we'd have a similar story with uh, Belshazzar, but we don't, do we? What do we see? He gets killed. And so we've heard through Daniel time and again that the Lord is sovereign. The Lord is the one who sets up kingdoms, tears down kingdoms. Similar today in our lives as well. He sets things up sometimes and he tears them down. So, how do we take that forward? God gives judgment on people. He gives judgment on me and you, but why does he tend to say, why does he save some of us? And then you look outside and you think, hang on, it's not fair this. God is sovereign in his salvation. I think the last reading I'm going to get one of these guys to do is from Romans 9, 15 to 18. Like I said, the Lord is sovereign over kings, over kingdoms. The Lord is sovereign in both salvation and judgment. That, that, that verse there that we just read, Paul just read, says that. So... Two bits I think we can take away. Firstly, know that God is patient and kind towards you, but don't presume on that patience. All the blessings we get and good gifts we get, we enjoy in this life are fruits of God's patience towards us. God has you know, restrained human wickedness uh, from killing us and being horrendous towards us. He supplies for each and individual person here today. Secondly, don't suppress the truth. If you know the truth, if you're a Christian, don't suppress it. We've all been exposed to that truth. You all here this morning know that truth, or you, you've heard bits about it, and we will be accountable to God. Like, ne like Belshazzar was, he knew that truth. He'd seen Nebuchadnezzar. He'd seen them in the, uh, the fiery furnace. And we've heard in Romans chapter 1. And even if you, all you know is about that, we've got to, we need to do something about it. So let me urge you, as we finish today, to turn to the word of God, to hear the gospel of God and what it is and be saved. As Christians, there's a sense that because we know this, because we know the word, or we should know the word, we cannot suppress that truth. So, for instance, when you hear this preached, or when you're in church, does it prick your conscience a little bit? What do you do with it? What do you, what's your, what do you take it, where do you take it to? Or do you humbly submit yourself to, to God in some way? And again, there's millions of ways we can do that, you know, from helping out, from evangelising through speaking to friends. Let's just do that. But let us go forth this week and extol that truth in our own lives and with our friends and our family. Let the truth that we know radiate in these dark times and let us be the light and truth in this world to all those who we know and love. Amen.